Hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Please mute yourself as you sign on. And if you are able to access the chat function, please introduce yourself via chat if possible. And we are going to get started. Um, I can't use chat. I'm introducing myself. I'm John Rudolph. I'm a cardiologist and rower in Portland, Oregon. Well, welcome, everybody. All right, well, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Heather Alshuler. I am the Strategic Initiatives Director at the George Pocock Rowing Foundation. Uh, for those of you who do not know what the George Pocock Rowing Foundation does, we are an organization that is committed to helping forever change the way youth find, start, and stay rowing. Uh, we run various programs across the US, including uh, nationwide. Oh, there are my kids. Hi, kiddos. <laughs> um, real life, right? Um, so we are a nationwide school program called ERGED, uh, and that introduces thousands of students to the sport each year. Um, as well as we help youth overcome barriers to participate in the sport, such as cost. Um, and we also have a partner network of boathouses uh, that are working together to uh, better the sport through more intentional, inclusive, and innovative uh, programming. So in that spirit of bringing boathouses together, together uh, the GPRF felt like the rowing community could benefit from coming together and wanted to provide a space for us to discuss the situation we have all found ourselves in at this time. Uh, no one has all of the answers to what the perfect balance is between so social responsibility, government mandates, and maintaining organizational health and sustainability um, as we face this unprecedented situation. But today our hope is to share ideas, um, ask questions, <laughs> and uh, also create a sense of community and reinforce the idea that uh, we are not in this on our own. Um, we are all part of a strong and healthy rowing community uh, and we have never been so much together in the same boat and situation before. So uh, the plan today is to try to create a space to hear from some other organizations as to how they are re um, responding right now and also have the time to answer or at the very least discuss some questions that might be floating around. Uh, we also have a guest from the University of Washington, uh, Dr. Kevin Alshuler, who will be leaving us with some tips about how to deal with uncertainty. So some housekeeping items before we dive in. Uh, please keep yourself on mute and utilize the, chunk, uh, the chat function as much as possible. Uh, we would love to hear from each of you. However, we do have quite a large group and it can be difficult to keep things progressing if we're all trying to speak at the same time. Um, if you don't have the, the chat function, I'll try to create some space so you can actually unmute yourself and ask your question if that's not an option for you. Um, but also introduce yourself via chat and include that email address so we can connect uh, at a later time, um, as well as send you some uh, follow-up information. Uh, feel free to ask questions and make comments as we go. I'm going to be monitoring those chats and um, trying to sort of facilitate the speakers. Um, I also want to just remind everybody that nobody has all of the answers or solutions to this and we want this to be a time to come together and support each other. Uh, we are most likely all emotionally charged and uneasy about what is happening but please keep this space free of judgment um, of to what others are doing if you don't agree with their response. All right, so okay with that. Um, I originally, we had set this call up to be regionally focused gathering. However, it quickly became very apparent that um, over the last couple of days that our fellow rowing boathouses really around the entire world are needing support and community through this situation. Uh, so I have invited a few boathouse directors and head coaches from some of our Seattle and 
and Portland area uh, rowing organizations to share about what their boathouses are doing uh, right now in response to the closures and social distancing recommendations. Um, so I'd like to introduce our four main boathouse speakers today. We have uh, Mark Davis from the Sammamish Rowing Association located in Redmond, Washington. We have Patrick McGovern from Pocock Rowing Center and Renton Rowing Center in Seattle, Washington. We have Nick Healy from Rose City Rowing Club in Portland, Oregon. And we also have Ben Steele from Vashon Island Rowing Club located on Vashon Island, Washington. All right, so thanks so much everyone for being here. Let's start with Mark from Sammamish. Um, so Mark, if you don't mind unmuting yourself if you're out there in one of my squares of many faces. Um, so starting off with Mark, um, what sort of response has Sammamish Rowing Association taken to this? Yeah, so um, thanks, and thanks for putting this all together too. I really appreciate it. It's good to hear um, from, from everybody and how we're dealing with this. Um, so we closed down on March 12th. Um, that's when our local school districts closed down and we decided to do the same thing and just shut everything down. Um, you know, there was talk about, well, maybe we keep masters open, maybe we just close the juniors or whatever. And we decided to just close everything down at once. Um, we've allowed some private boat owners to store their boats outside so they could still have access to them if they wanted to come down and row. Um, and some people have taken advantage of that. But, um, yeah, we've just, we've closed everything down and, and now, like most people, we're in a, a wait and see mode. You know, we just don't know. Um, and we know that the, the schools in the area are, are closed all the way through April. And um, that's what we're planning on right now. And we don't, aren't sure what to do beyond that until we know, um, you know, what everybody else is going to be doing. Uh, everybody else being the, the general community as a whole. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and we're working with, with the board to send that messaging out to our members and letting them know where we are. Oh, great. Um, let's, uh, and again, if you have questions or comments, please just throw it in the chat um, and we will uh, make sure we get to them. Um, let's move to Patrick um, from Seattle. Um, and he is the boathouse director of two different boathouses, Pocock Rowing Center and Renton Rowing Center. So Patrick, um, what have your boathouses taken in terms of the response to this? Yeah, much like, uh, much like Mark, we have uh, uh, closed the facility. Uh, you know, working through that decision-making process, I think was a little bit of a test of our organization, test of our culture and, uh, you know, in particular how we make decisions. And yeah, anyway, I think it was a, uh, I think it was a good process and it went smoothly. Uh, and we relied on a lot of, you know, we, we relied on having the right people in the right positions uh, everywhere from our volunteer management committees to our staff. Uh, so yeah, we uh, have sent out all of our equipment uh, that can be sent out the door has been sent out. We've gotten over 75 ergometers out the door to our uh, members and uh, yeah, the youth athletes as well. Uh, our staff has done just a tremendous job in finding a way to do remote coaching and athlete engagement. Uh, they're using just every tool at their disposal to yeah, maintain our community in, uh, in these tough times, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, let's move to Nick uh, from Rose City in Portland, Oregon. So, Nick, what, what response has Rose City taken? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, it's good to see everyone, by the way. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, yeah, so I'm at Rose City and also uh, the Portland Boathouse. So the Portland Boathouse is, you know, Station L, Dragon Boat Team, uh, a bunch of different organizations. Um, Rose City shut down you know, a week and a half ago, um, shut down everything, sent home um, all the equipment that we could. Um, and then the Portland Boathouse has been kind of shutting down the different organizations um, more or less over the, over the last week and a half, but everything is, is very shut down now to the point where, you know, some of the, the, uh, the equipment is locked up so people can't take it out. Um, if they're, if they're using club equipment because people are sneaky, they'll try and get out in the water. 
but uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, so the, the challenge now is, is pivoted to, you know, how can we keep our athletes engaged? And I think at Rose City, what we've been trying to do, um, you know, I, I, it's become more and more apparent. I think it, it became apparent even as early as the beginning of last week that the spring season was probably done. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just apparent to us as coaches, it was apparent to the athletes as well. So I think at that point, it became that, you know, that our number one challenge became not about, um, you know, talking about technique or even, you know, we're sending out training ideas and we're, we're telling them this is, you know, here's an idea for what you can do today. If you have a bike or, you know, we have a, we have a challenge on Instagram that we've set up, we've split the team up into different groups and, and we're challenging the different groups to, to see how many minutes they can do just exercising. Um, but I think the main challenge right now is really to, uh, you know, maintain cohesiveness um, of the team and also just serve as mentors um, for the kids um, who are, are going to be facing some pretty significant emotional challenges. Um, you know, you know, being stuck at home, um, being away from their friends, I, you know, I, there are several athletes on the team whose parents are doctors who, you know, are going to be called away and are, you know, in, in a you know, high likelihood going to get sick. And, and, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to friends around the a world that are, are getting sick now. So everyone's kind of feeling that stress. And so um, I think we're, we're trying to pivot as best we can without being psychologists um, to, you know, how can we be mentors um, how can we be a support system for the athletes um, in a way that that is correct? You know, so I, I've been trying to figure out a way that we can be FaceTiming the athletes without going outside of the bounds of safe sport. And, and, and you know, it's difficult when everyone is isolated. Um, but we're trying to use Instagram as a platform, sending out emails uh, very regularly, um, just trying to keep the kids talking to each other as well. Um, and supporting each other and just reminding everybody that, you know, just the human contact is half the, half the thing that they enjoy about being on the team, you know, and, and that takes effort. We noticed a real drop off in um, participation over the course of the weekend. And so now Monday morning started and we're back at it like, okay, we got to keep this going. We got to keep talking. We got to keep communicating. So that's the, that's the thrust of it right now. There's not much else we can do. Um, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's go to Ben Steele from Vashon Island. And Ben, what is your uh, club doing in terms of response? Yeah, so um, the initial response, um, we don't have a very big group. Um, we have about 40 masters and 30 juniors right now. And so there was this kind of tentativeness in the actual membership. You know, well, why would we want to close down you know we have a moat around our entire homeland um, but we ended up kind of following suit with the school programs who uh, closed down till April 24th uh, even before it was mandated um, and that's been interesting we've loaned out all the ergs we have at this point uh, I've loaned out some weight bars um, and we let everybody get their personal shells out of the boathouse before I locked it up. Um, and in the time being, just trying to send out uh, weekly workouts. Our master's coach is going to be communicating um, weekly workouts and strategies for the masters to stay in touch, stay in shape, uh, keep the community going, because that's really what the Vashon Boathouse thrives on. And as for the kids, I'm doing the same thing. And they actually asked me to start a series where I post what I eat in a day to them on the Vash on Instagram, because they want to know, like, what can I do to eat healthy and cook when I have absolutely nothing else to do? Uh, so I'm going to start that today. And at least for the first question, that, that's kind of where we're at. Great. Well, wonderful. So um, that's just sort of like overall response from everybody. And there's some great comments coming in. Um, a lot of comments have to do with the engagement of your rowing community. So um, just to sort of share some of the things that are going on, um, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna give credit because I was just sort of writing them down, um, but a lot of mention about learning, uh, loaning out equipment and ergs, um, workouts being posted and shared through social media. Uh, someone mentioned a bingo game that they have going on for 
um, through this time of different challenges um, using uh, technology and uh, ways to stay connected through Zoom meeting workouts, uh, WhatsApp, um, and also live streaming things to members. So sort of piggybacking off that, um, let's go into a few more details about how you are keeping, you know, your rowing community engaged uh, through this time. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit more about organizational health and sustainability um, from more of the operating standpoint. But in terms of community, since that is really what we're what we're all about and missing through this time. So um, let's go to Ben to start. So Ben, uh, if you could just sort of elaborate, you did mention a few things that you were doing to keep your community engaged. Um, any more details that you'd like to share about that? Yeah, so um, the masters have uh, obviously their own email group and they, are really kind of self-sustaining their community by sending jokes to each other. Like the other day, it was someone's birthday and, you know, they Photoshopped a picture of him and he's like our old guy who's always late to everything. Um, and so that sense of community, they're really able to maintain on their own since, you know, we're, we are a small boathouse and we're really, really close as a group. Um, outside of that, the, the way we're communicating workouts or trying to is, you know, telling people, get on the phone with a friend if you can do this. Stay in touch with your boat mates. You know, the WhatsApp, uh, Instagram is all in the works so people can stay in touch because, as you say, the community is, is really what, you know, we all love rowing, but the community is what's going to keep people active in these strange times. Um, and Outside of that, um, I'm really open to more ideas, but you know, the, the food is gonna be interesting. I didn't realize the kids were all so excited about that aspect. And I think that's just, you know, any way we can virtually coach and just contribute is gonna be a really big deal. And the parents have really liked when I send out my uh, weekly workouts, I like to add a thing, you know, help out with this around the house this week. Don't be a bum, you know, clean up your own laundry for a week you know, do your own dishes for a week. Uh, and we get a lot of positive responses from actual parents, you know, and that's a, that's a key element that um, with the junior program, you got to address. Um, and that's, that's most of what we're doing so far. That's great. Um, wonderful. So let's, um, let's go to Nick. Nick, do you have anything else to share about um, your community engagement efforts through this time? Um, well, I kind of outlined it a little bit. Um, we, you know, I'm sending out workouts. Um, we, we send out a workout schedule. We, we initially set the thing up to be two weeks, you know, kind of hopefully, okay, this is, this is a two week plan. We, we split the team up into three groups, created Instagram pages for all the groups. The staff is a separate Instagram page. We set up a challenge um, that was workout oriented um, and we're tracking, they, they have a way to report in the minutes that they're doing. We can't do, uh, you know, specifically on the ERG, it, it is just number of minutes that they're doing exercising. And so at the end of every day, uh, we publish a pie chart that says the red team did this, you know, percentage or the, you know, the gold team did this percentage and try and keep a little bit of uh, healthy competition going there. But then we also have kind of the fun aspect, which is we provide a different uh, challenge on Instagram every day. Um, for them that it looks like different things, you know, tom tomorrow is, is throwback uh, Tuesday. We're doing Tuesday, which is going to be baby pictures. Uh, and, you know, so uh, the, it's just a way to, to, to get them to come and remember that there's a team. That's the, the goal is to just to, you know, they all like Instagrams, right? So um, I've had to learn how to do that. And uh, so, you know, it's just to get them to come to the page and remember, oh, yeah, you know, Billy, yeah, I, I usually just see him at practice because I don't go to school with them. Or, you know, just remember that these people are out there and that everyone's going through the same thing. And just try and keep it a little bit light. Now, again, you know, I think, I think we're having to reassess now. If we're, if we're looking at, the, at, at all the way through April and May being, in, you know, unable to, to, to collect the team together physically, we're going to have to look at, you know, trying to figure out how we do stuff like this, like the Zoom meetings. And, and what are we going to talk about? Because in my mind, yes, it would be interesting for the kids to, to, to talk about how you do the catch. 
it would be interesting to go over video and we've, we've talked about doing that. But I think probably more importantly, our, our role as leaders is to just try and keep them focused on goal setting on a daily basis and what can they do in the situation that they're in um, to stay positive, to stay moving forward, to stay constructive. So um, that's kind of what we're putting our mind to right now. Like, you know, how, you know, how can we have a team meeting where everyone can contribute? I don't want to just talk at them for 45 minutes, um, you know, but something that's going to be interesting and useful for them. That's great. So that's where we are now. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Um, let's go back to Mark. Um, Mark, do you have any uh, more details about how you're trying to keep your community engaged through this time? Yeah, I think we're, what we're trying to do, sorry, I touched my face. Um, <laughs> what what we're trying to do is, is reach out to each group at their level. Um, so for masters, you know, we have three different masters groups um, and most of them are used to Slack. You know, some of them have, have used it in their work life. So we're trying to reach them at that level. Each master's group has their own Slack um, communication and we let each head coach kind of run that. And, um, you know, what we try to do is have those head coaches just communicate what they want to to their athletes. And then on the junior level, it's more similar to what Nick's doing. It's the Instagram because that's what juniors are used to. They're used to communicating that way. They understand that it works for them. It is a learning process for some of the older people involved, but we're trying to reach them at their level so they're comfortable with that. Um, and we're doing this similar things, you know, we're sending, uh, workouts, um, we plan to be doing, you know, uh, yoga classes that we're going to set up that people can join in from one of our guys who does our dry land workouts. We'll send erg workouts. We'll do erg technique. Um, Liza, our boys coach is going to teach them how to do, you know, how to make nutritious energy bars. Uh, so we're just trying to be really creative in, in many different ways um, that the other programs are talking about and how we can keep them engaged, keep them thinking about the team, keep reminding them how much they love rowing and how much they love being a part of SRA. Like that's our constant themes that we're trying to keep hitting on all the time. That even though they're not coming down here to the boathouse, that that we're still here and we'll start, we'll still part of this community. So th those are the messages we're trying to hit all the time. Wonderful. Um, just to go to a question that I'd like to pose and then we'll get to Patrick, how his boathouses are staying engaged. But um, one comment was, how are people overcoming the challenge of reaching potentially kids or members that don't have access to technology or even aren't able to really operate technology? So, you know, some of our older members and maybe even not so older members might not know how to access, you know, Facebook or Slack or WhatsApp. Um, how are we reaching everyone? Um, and especially that those, those youth that are involved that don't have smartphones or even internet access. And um, Pat Tyrone, if you, if I can invite you to comment, um, I saw that you're comment came up that you have found a way to reach everyone but not easily so if you could elaborate on that i'd love to invite you to unmute yourself or or you can comment too <laughs> so she um she just commented that she uses phone calls um and reaching out to parents through uh phone so that's that's great um any other ideas from anyone on that reaching all members that maybe aren't able to access that technology All right, so maybe that's just something we can all think about as we're starting to come up with our with our plans. Um, that's great. All right, um, I'd like to also um, invite Patrick to comment on this engagement piece with the community. So Patrick from Seattle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, making sure the athletes are connected with one another, not just their coaches and the organization. That's a uh, driving factor in the way our yeah the way our coaches are maintaining engagement uh, with the athletes. We've got uh, the different boathouses are using either a combination of Team Snap, uh, the Group Me app, uh, looking at investigating into iCrew uh, for a uh, yeah one of our teams that uses iCrew for other things. So yeah, that seems like a natural platform to use to keep our novice girls squad engaged. Uh, for instance, uh, some of our teams are a little bit more dialed in on using uh, Google Sheets, right? They use that in the course of some of their other normal team operations. So 
sort of an accountability workout log has been a yeah, tactic that uh, Alex and our youth program is uh, currently using. So we're finding that it is a little bit of a trial and error. Uh, different age groups have different, uh, yeah, I think as Mark alluded to, they have different different platforms that they're comfortable using. So yeah, meeting the athletes where they are is, is our, I think, our best tactic. Uh, we've kind of done some experimenting with uh, streaming some workouts on, on Facebook, so sort of a live aspect of yeah, a group uh, a group activity. Uh, yeah, most likely looking to do some YouTube videos as well for uh, either like a demonstration of proper lifting technique. We haven't gotten into any rowing technique there yet, but that's certainly something that's uh, on the horizon. And then uh, also having the athletes send their coaches a uh, video of themselves rowing and, you know, get a great opportunity for the coaches to get individual feedback to the athletes about the rowing that they've got their gometer at home or, you yeah, know, whatever footage they may have uh, sort of in the banks of footage that we've got on everybody's uh, phone. So, yeah. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I'd like to pivot a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, organizational health and sustainability. So um, a lot of sort of questions come up about um, just being able to sustain through this time and whether or not issuing refunds for current spring seasons um, are in place or still charging members as you move forward um, and just sort of what, what approach everybody is taking with that. So uh, starting off, uh, I would like to um, start out with Nick. Nick, would you be able to share what, uh, what approach your organization is taking in terms of health and sustainability? Um, well, we, uh, just in terms of, of dues and all the rest of that stuff, we started with simply making an effort to collect uh, outstanding dues <laughs> from the fall and the winter. Um, and, you know, without getting into the weeds of what we're charging for the spring and what we're not charging for the spring, it seemed like we wanted to collect as much money as we knew we were owed and, and kind of shore that up to start with. In terms of the spring, um, we've had kind of a mixed response, I think. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the parents have just paid for the spring, um, and they understand that, the, that their responsibility is to, um, try and keep the club as healthy as they can. But a lot of them are also, you know, suitably nervous. And, uh, so we, we are allowing them to, um, you know, pay for March, uh, or, you know, whatever. And then, um, we'll see what happens. But as we're shut down, we're not, we're not going to insist that they pay the whole spring. Um, I think that we've had a pretty good response from the parents in terms of them recognizing that we're still making an effort to coach their kids. Um, and the coaches, I have to say, um, have been pretty remarkable in terms of their willingness to just take it on the chin. Um, some of, you know, obviously they're, they're, we get paid by the hour, um, most of the coaches. So, that the hours are very reduced and they're, they're all saying we can, we can handle it. Um, so, you know, that's about all we're doing right now is just trying to cut back as much as we can on the expenditures. The rent is, is probably going to be crippling in about four months <laughs> um, to be honest. But, uh, but for now we're just trimming it down to, to rent and, and the bare necessities. Um, and, uh, and that's about it. All right. Great. Thanks for sharing. Um, Patrick, can we move to you and your organize, organization's response in terms of health and sustainability? Yeah, for sure. We have, uh, number one, obviously cut out all non-essential spending from here until the end of the year, uh, which obviously is uh, kind of a no-brainer. Um, what we've uh, done with our members, our adult members, we've asked them to continue to pay their dues. Uh, right? We have a structure where we have team fee or coaching fee, in addition to membership dues in the organization. Obviously, it's a pretty big boathouse. There's about 300 adult members, so there are a number of different classes of membership. Uh, but our logic on that is really twofold. Number one, it is uh, you know, make sure that we can continue to have a boathouse. Uh, and then number two, uh, we want would like to keep the staff employed through this time. So we're continuing to pay our coaches uh, during the downtime. You know, a number of our coaches rely on us for a good portion of their income. 
uh, you know, kind of like Nick said, the coaches have been great about working with their athletes and they are working very hard and logging time. Uh, on the parent side of things, the same thing. I think everybody understands that there are a lot of fixed costs involved in the rowing season. Same thing. I think the parents are very, uh, very fond of our culture, very fond of our staff. So they want to make sure that the staff stays together and make sure that we continue to uh, uh, be able to offer rowing for the foreseeable future. Uh, our community in Renton is a little bit different. Um, kind of recognizing that some people have less capacity to pay for services they're not, not getting. So yeah, that's been a little bit more of an exercise in, uh, in particular being creative about offering them some type of services during the, during the closure, but also reaching out to other stakeholders. Uh, I was looking to renegotiate our lease with the city of Renton. That would be a real, real home run to, you know, if we were, uh, we took an operating loss because people weren't paying fees. We could continue to keep the boathouse open by yeah, relying on our partner in the city to, to help us out there. So uh, I think our primary focus at this point, looking through, uh, you know, it's not going to be terribly disruptive if we get going sometime in June uh, or before think that the real critical point is if we lose our summer programming, uh, uh, we figure that is a real, that's going to be a real tough scenario uh, if we're, if we can't offer our regular classes, camps during the summer. So yeah, that's kind of where we are. All right. Thank you for sharing, Pedrick. Um, ben, how is your club feeling in terms of organizational health and sustainability? Yeah, so Vashon is an interesting demographic. Our island community is, um, there, there's a population who are, you know, very wealthy and there's a population who, you know, rowing is a really hard choice for them right now to continue those dues. So we're in the process of putting out the best solution to both masters and juniors. Um, we charge our spring season for juniors out in quarterly payments no matter what um, so we've had two of those go out so far before this happened uh, so we imagine those will stay um, as far as regattas we didn't get to attend a single regatta um, so we're we're gonna have to um, plan on refunding that because you know you don't go to the regatta um, you know there's not much point in paying that for the families who need every ounce of that money. Um, so I think our plan on how we offer it is, you know, we're offering up to a full refund on the second half of spring season and all regattas. If you need that, if you are able to help contribute and keep our club moving forward, um, please reach out to us and we can figure out how we want to do that on an individual basis because we are small enough that we can manage it family by family and, and make those the best. So I know that doesn't work for a lot of people because there's a lot of big clubs in this group, but for us, uh, that's how we want to keep our community close and personal and uh, really make sure everyone feels like they have the best solution for them. Uh, on the master side, it's going to be a little bit different because their structure is different but it's going to be similar if you want to keep this um you're, you're welcome to just keep your dues in and and not have them come back but i think there's going to be a few people who say well there's no season you know we, we need this to come out um but i also think we'll, we'll have quite a few people who are able to keep that money invested in the club and the coaches uh, we are worried if this goes long term, which it probably will as a member of a fire department. I can tell you that it's probably going to go a little longer than we hope. Um, we're, we're a little worried, as Nick said, if it goes into summer uh, or maybe it was Patrick, if it goes into summer, we're going to have a bit of a, a hurt. And um, we're putting together a bunch of different financial contingency plans on how long this goes and, and what that will look like for us. But that's all getting developed in the next few days. 
and we plan to make a big announcement to all of our members you know this is what it's going to look like if we can't row for two months this is what it's like for three months four months five months half a year um and we're just trying to have all those continue the plans in in place because being so small we don't have a big bank set up we have enough that can keep us going for a few months um but after that we'd be a little bit worried for all of our coaches, including if it goes on for more than once. All right, Very great. much looming over us right now, and we're trying to figure out the best way to manage. Great, well, thank you, Ben. Um, finally, let's go to Mark. Mark, what are your worries in terms of your organizational health and sustainability? Yeah, I think I just echo what the other three guys said. Um, so we, ha we haven't made any decisions yet what we're going to be doing as far as um, refunds on, on dues and fees. Um, the board will be making a decision actually this week and we'll be getting that information out to our members. Um, but it's the same concerns and, and we have some of the same positive things too, where, uh, a lot of our, our part-time coaches who just work hourly or just, you know, they have other full-time jobs and they're like, don't worry about it, you know, and they've been fantastic, but we also have, you know, several full-time salaried positions. Um, and we're going to try everything we can to make sure that all of those people are able to get paid. But at the same time, we're balancing that with making sure that when we start rowing again, that we have, you know, uh, the actual club is here and ready to go. Um, you know, so it's, it's a balancing act, um, that I think we're all kind of dealing with. Um, and, and I don't know what that right answer is. I don't think there is one. I think it's different for everybody and where they are and where they're located. Um, so we we have put some projections out there, um, and saying, okay, if we're, if we're closed for, you know, one month, two months, three months, what does that mean? I think my concerns are similar to um, to Patrick's is like if we're down in the summertime and that's really when we get all of our new rowers out here, which affects our numbers for the fall. Um, that's when, you know, that's when things really could take a big tumble. So that's our, our main concerns uh, with our organizations, but it's similar to everybody else. Um, I don't really know what the best answer is to that. Um, you know, and I think it just goes back to our, our messaging, you know, that making sure that people are really thinking about, about rowing and thinking about the club and why they like it. Well, great. Well, thank you for sharing. So, yeah, you know, I think all, everyone seems to sort of echo the same thing as uh, nobody has all the answers at this time. But um, thank you. I think these thoughts and these comments uh, are really appreciated. And I'm sure everyone on this call, you know, starting to think um, there's a few other comments that have been made, um, some great ideas. Uh, David Setter ha had a suggestion about potentially uh, setting up some inner club competition um, and maybe you know, maybe some clubs here could get together and have some virtual racing and that sort of thing could be a fun way to keep uh, communities engaged through this time. Um, and also um, there were a few different comments from a few different clubs. Um, the one I'm looking at right now is from Pocock Rowing Center. Uh, they are posting workouts and infographics on Facebook and Instagram, as well as live streaming yoga Tuesdays and Thursdays um, that's open and free to everybody. So. Um, potentially sharing resources amongst all the clubs that are signed on today and sharing between, you know, all rowing clubs in general. Um, so fabulous. Uh, keep putting those comments and questions um, in that uh, chat box or um, uh, anyone that's on the phone that would like to make a comment. Um, I'll just give you a moment now to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question if you have a question uh, before we uh, move to our next segment. All right. Um, well, in that case, um, we are going to uh, transition a little bit about this from this uh, boathouse specifics um, to something that is 
tangible and we can actually take with us and feel like we do have a little bit more of the answers to. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Kevin Allshuler, the associate, associate professor at uh, University of Washington Medicine, um, to discuss how to cope with uncertainty. Uh, he will be sharing some valuable strategies that will be helpful to yourself, staff, coaches, and members. Um, and yes, we have the same last name and home address. I knew he was available, um, but nevertheless, um, thank you, um, Dr. Olshuler, for uh, joining us today. It took a pandemic for her to figure out how to make good use of me. Okay. <laughs> It's nice to meet all of you. You probably saw me at the beginning making the cameo, removing the kid from the room. Um, <laughs> we're all obviously here balancing some of the same challenges. So let me just get some slides up here on the screen. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, so I am a psychologist at the University of Washington. Um, I also have a background in sports, both for sports psychology, but also relevant to this group is I was director of rowing at Ann Arbor Rowing Club about 15 years ago. So I have lived a day in your shoes um, and certainly understand this, uh, how this challenge is for all of you. Um, a, a lot of my work as a psychologist focuses on how people cope with uncertain or unknown situations. Um, I work with patients living with multiple sclerosis and for those of you who don't know MS very well, MS is a disease where our patients get um, progressively worse over time, but in uneven and unknown ways. So this is an area where we've been doing just a ton of work. Um, so my hope is that we can translate some of that here to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I can give you a little bit of an understanding of where we in psychology come from in terms of understanding uncertainty. And then most important, I, I want to send you away with some tools or at least some concepts that you can work with with your groups. Um, I've been listening in the whole time and I think uh, to a large extent uh, this group is already doing really great things, um, but hopefully this talk will help you understand from a psychology perspective why the things you're doing are helpful as well. So I think we all know COVID-19 probably better than we would like to at this point. Uh, we all understand it's an infectious uh, disease that's caused by um, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. Um, it's now classified as a pandemic um, and certainly is impacting all of our daily lives at this point. And I think these things are obvious, right? It's so difficult because it's an unknown, it's uncontrolled, um, it's poorly understood. And then on top of all those things which make people uneasy, um, there's also this threat to our well-being, right? There's life and death, which is obviously <laughs> the biggest threat, um, but also to our way of life, our ability to make a living. Um, I think for our athletes or, or club members, it's also a threat to our social outlets, our coping strategies, and so forth. And from a psychology perspective, when we feel out of control, we feel more distressed. And this goes for everybody. We're gonna talk in a minute about how that varies from person to person, but, but this, everybody feels more distressed when they feel more out of control. Same thing if we feel like we're threatened, right? If our safety or our well-being is threatened, we also feel more distressed. And so obviously right now, the, the general public is feeling a lot more distressed. And, and I think one thing that's just really important to, to recognize is that that's normal. We would really be worried or, or even wonder about people you know, who aren't concerned, right? If there, if there were people around you who said, ah, oh, this isn't a big deal, you'd kind of worry about them and you'd worry if, if they're really approaching this the right way. So it's normal to be, dis, to be distressed and this can't be avoided and really we don't want to eliminate it because if we're eliminating that distress, it, it probably means that we're not handling this the right way. So with that as the background, then let's talk about this uncertainty and this unknown that, that's you know, surrounding this crisis. So like I said, nobody likes uncertainty. 
And in general, when we have something in our, our lives that we don't like, we try to make it stop, right? This goes down to our most basic instincts. So if we're hungry, we go and eat. Um, if we're tired, we go and sleep, right? So when there's something in our lives that, that we are uncomfortable with, we try to make it stop or we try to change it. And how urgently we do that can vary based on a number of things about ourselves. But one of the biggest topics that we've been looking at is this concept of intolerance of uncertainty. So if a person can tolerate uncertainty in their lives, they're gonna be less distressed and they're gonna feel less urgency to make this distressing thing stop. If they're intolerant of uncertainty, they, they can't stand it. They have to make it go away. And we're gonna talk in a second about two different ways that people do that. But our instinct is if uncertainty is causing me to feel distressed, then I have to eliminate the uncertainty. And we're gonna talk here and when we get into the solutions about how this is um, a natural way to feel, but it often pushes us towards some bad or less than ideal choices. So this continuum here is how we, um, how people um, cope with or respond to uncertainty. And I should mention as I'm going through, I'm gonna make sure these slides are sent out so you don't feel like you have to be keeping up with the slides. Um, at one end of the coping uh, continuum are, are our ostriches, right? Our people with their head in the sand, the avoiders, okay? The ones who are just trying not to think about the uncertainty at all costs. At the other end are our chronic worriers, the people who just can't stop worrying, can't stop reading news, resources, social media, and so forth. And then in the middle are the people who learn how to control what they can control, and coexist with the distress. So this is a slide I often use, but I thought relevant to the current crisis, we might think of this also in terms of toilet paper, right? So right now I think we're all aware of the, the shortage of toilet paper or, or paper products, right? So our avoiders have no concern about this. They haven't gone out and bought a single roll of toilet paper because they figure they're gonna go to the store tomorrow and be fine. Right? So these folks are kind of missing the opportunity to do what they can do to take care of themselves. Our worriers are buying $5,000 in toilet paper, right? And we've all seen them on the news, or maybe when you were at Costco the last time you saw them. And that's probably way too much to buy, and it's causing additional problems for them, financial or for society or what have you. And then in the middle, the control the controllables group has gone out, made sure they've, they've covered what they need to cover um, in terms of you know, buying a, a reasonable amount, but that's it, then they've moved on. So if we go back to the original picture, and then if we just add to this functioning or quality of life, we think people function at their best and, and um, have their best quality of life when they're in that middle zone. When they're avoiding, they're missing chances to help themselves. When they're worrying endlessly, they're probably taking time that could be better spent on things that make their lives better, and they're putting it into worry, which is increasing distress for them. And so what we're gonna talk about here for these last few minutes is how to push people to the middle. And really, uh, having worked in psychology now for 15 years or so, I can tell you we can't push people right? But what we can do is we can give them the opportunities and, and the guidance and the um, resources and so forth that will help guide them back towards the middle. Now, many of you are probably uh, familiar with the term resilience. Uh, with, uh, this has been obviously very popular, not just in psychology, but in pop culture in general over the last decade or so. And when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about having that ability to bounce back and, and flourish or thrive when we're faced with a stressor. But one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize in, with resilience is that resilience isn't any specific thing. It's a combination of a variety of behaviors. And so I've given talks in the past to, um, to coaches and athletes about resilience and really tried to impress on them that 
what we want to build if we're going to build resilience is we're going to build resilient behaviors, right? And if a person can maximize their toolbox of resilient behaviors, then they will be more resilient in the face of a challenge. So what are we looking for here? Well, here I think there's three main resilience areas that we want to think about for our members, um, our athletes, and, and for ourselves. And I'm going to talk about each of these. So they'll be acknowledging the distress, uh, controlling the controllables within reason, and coexisting with the uncontrollable and the unknown, which is certainly the hardest one for most people. So if we start with acknowledging the distress, it's important to understand that when we as humans feel distressed, a lot of times we jump past the part where we actually acknowledge that we feel that way. And instead we respond to the distress. So if we're mad, we might throw something or we might yell or something like that. If we're sad, we start crying. If we're happy, we start laughing, but, but we don't say, I feel mad or I feel angry or I feel sad or I feel happy. We skip right over that and we start reacting to it. And while that can be okay, if we're making any you know, kind of mistakes or, or errors in our coping, we don't have a chance to fix that when we jump over acknowledging how we're feeling in that moment. So when we acknowledge the distress, we become more likely to be able to work with it. And when we don't acknowledge it, we just run with whatever reactions we naturally have. So this a lot of times feels like kind of the fluffy or flowery part of psychology, but, but this piece is really important. If people can't kind of take that minute and, and look at how they're feeling, they don't have an opportunity to change how they're responding. So this step just can't be, can't be skipped. Controlling the controllables is probably the one that sounds most obvious, right? We want people to control the things that they actually can have an impact on. But when people feel distressed, it's hard to know what you truly can control, right? If you're a worrier, which many people are, and you're really concerned about your well being, you might hold out hope that if you try a little harder or you do a little bit more, you're going to have a better outcome. So it's hard to know where to stop. And where we usually guide people is to look at trusted sources. So I know there's lots of concern about information and, and so forth that's out there and in the public at this point, but there's pretty clear guidance right now from the CDC, the health department, state and local governments about you know, staying home, staying away from other people, washing your hands, uh, having two weeks of supplies at home, and, and things like that. And it's important that people try to focus on those guidelines because I don't think, when we feel really distressed, I, I don't think we do a great job of really recognizing when we've kind of overdone it on trying to grab for control, right? So we can't rely on our gut feeling when we feel distressed. It's helpful to have some concrete guidelines to go off of. But then let's get to the hardest part, and, and this will be the part that um, will, will take us to the finish here, the coexisting with the uncontrollable and the unknown. So if you've acknowledged how you feel and you've taken care of all of the controllable pieces that are within reason, there's still a huge part of this that just sits there. It's uncontrolled, it's unknown, it's threatening, it's just really uncomfortable. And if we're gonna work with that, we have to change away from trying to find a way to not be distressed anymore to finding a way to tolerate or coexist with it. Because if we coexist with it well, we will become less distressed over time. And from a practical sense, this is gonna require having a few strategies in your back pocket. So here we go with the strategies part. So, there's basically four um, categories of response to um, that distress around uncertainty. There's a physiological component, a cognitive or thinking component, a behavioral or action component, and a social interaction part. So when we feel distressed, we're really activated physiologically. Our, our thoughts are focused on the threats and less focused on everything else in our lives. 
Our behaviors are focused on self-protection and less on doing the things that add to our lives. And we become more isolated, especially in a situation like this where we're supposed to be at home. So, so we want to have strategies that counteract each of those, right? We want to be able to lessen the physiological response. We want to be able to focus on the present and not be hyper-focused on the threats. We want to be able to engage in the things that are meaningful to us, and we want to be able to interact with other people. So if we move this, this over one column, here's some things for you to think about. And this is where I thought you all were doing a really good job already. So for the physiological response, it's important for people to have strategies to be able to calm themselves down. And this could be a formal thing like meditation or relaxation strategies. Um, there's great apps out there. Headspace is super popular. Um, but it also could be as simple as sitting outside or taking a warm bath or going for a walk. Um, you know, anything that, that a person finds calming or, or relaxing. From a cognitive side, it's important for people to have the ability to have things in their world to focus on. So one of the things we often see is people recognize that maybe they're spending too much time focused on the news or social media or things like that, but they just try to stop that and they don't have a plan for what they're gonna redirect themselves to. And I think this is a great spot where you can come in. You can provide them with something to do when they stop worrying, when they stop reading the news and so forth, right? They could do one of your remote group workouts or participate in, in um, one of these other remote programs that I heard you all talking about. The cognitive piece and the behavior piece often kind of merge together, right? So when we're thinking and we're acting, these two often um, go together. And so, you know, kind of building on that previous point with the cognitive piece, you know, it's great if people can have a, a list or a set of options of enjoyable activities, meaningful activities that are really, um, that add value to their life, that, um, that contribute to their, you know, higher quality of life. And having figured those out in advance then is helpful because once you're distressed and you're really bothered by something, sometimes it's hard to brainstorm what those new ideas are. And then social interaction is, is also just a huge one right now. You know, there's a lot of concern around the social distancing terminology, um, a lot of belief that maybe we should have used the words physical distancing. Um, I, I think this is a huge one in the sports community. You know, so many athletes get so much from their sports. They get their coping strategies, right? It's a way for them to burn off energy. It's a way for them to be around people. It's a way to feel good about something that you're doing. Exercise obviously helps. It's kind of this complete package for a lot of our athletes. And I think that um, having to have boathouses shut down or other sports activities stopped, you know, I think is having a huge effect on the athlete community because it's kind of shut them off to their, their traditional toolbox. So I'm hoping you can think about these things, uh, not just for yourselves, but also as leaders. And so this is the last slide I have, but just some food for thought for you, for all of you. I think your members, your athletes are looking to you for guidance. Uh, there's unfortunately no scenario here where you get to kind of skip out on responsibility for this. Um, you can help people cope better, or if you were doing a poor job, which is not what I heard at all in this talk, but if you're doing a poor job, you could make things worse as well. And so here's kind of three questions that I would suggest you ask yourselves. Are you helping people work with the distress or are you reacting to the distress, right? Because when we react to it, we're usually trying to make it stop. Are you decreasing uncertainty by giving them some clear guidance on what you're doing as a club? Um, and how you might um, be able to interact with them remotely? Or is, are you increasing uncertainty by giving vague or inconsistent guidance? And what I would say is the clear, concise guidance can even be clearly stating that there's things that you just don't know, right? It's better to say, we don't know when we're gonna be back on the water. We don't know when we're gonna be open than to kind of string it along or, or be wishy-washy about it. 
And then the last thing is, you know, are you helping people find ways to coexist with the distress? Are you helping them find things that they can do uh, um, that help them feel better, that help them, you know, feel like they're a, still a part of your club, um, as opposed to suddenly feeling like they're adrift because they've been cut off from rowing. So with that, um, I'm gonna be happy to take questions. Uh, uh, in addition to the slides, I'm gonna have Heather send out a, a resource. It's about five pages long, uh, but it reinforces a lot of these points. And it's something that um, the author of it has said to share as, as broadly as we can. Um, and I think it aligns with a lot of what I talked about. So I'd, I'm happy to have that sent out as well and um, in case you're interested in learning more about this as well. Um, but Heather, if there's time, I'm happy to take questions or uh, respond afterwards, whatever's best. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the comment box. But um, thank you so much for sharing those tips with all of us. Um, hopefully you can find some value in, uh, in some of that in terms of your own reactions as well as bringing it to your members and coworkers and coaches um, and whatnot. So um that sort of brings us to the end and you know thank you so much for joining us i we had over 60 people here today so i mean i really think that's just a testament to how we are all needing community as well um just as does your your um boat houses and rowing communities uh and you know i just think that we should feel really fortunate that we can be a part of something like this um, and though many of us are feeling very isolated and alone, I think that it's truly, the world has never actually been so united. So um, we can work our way through this. And the George Pocock Rowing Foundation is um, you know, committed to helping just sort of be a space that we can all come together and be, be sustainable and strong. So when things do get to the other side of it, we can sort of return to normal and get back on the water and get all of those youth and rowers of all ages um, back into the physical connection of our community. Um, so do please stay connected. Um, please comment again if you can. Um, we would like to host another one of these in a couple weeks time to come back together. You know, I think things are evolving very quickly and I think we can draw support and strength from each other and really generate some great ideas. Uh, if and if you are unable to comment um, on that chat function, uh, please send me an email, heather at pocockfoundation.org, or you can connect through our website at pocockfoundation.org. Um, and I'll just make sure that you get on that mailing list so you can have, um, have information about our, our next call that we're hoping to host again in about two weeks time. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and wishing everyone um, health and safety. Uh, as we get through this. All right, thanks so much.